And basically, Christians are the ones that are being ostracized in our culture today. Let me share with you the context of Acts chapter 17. Paul, as he does quite a bit, he goes on these missionary journeys. He goes and preaches in the synagogues. And that's what he's doing in Thessalonica. He goes in and he declares to them who Jesus Christ is. That he is the fulfillment of the scriptures. That he died and he rose again according to the scriptures. But the Jews do not handle this news well. Why? Because they rejected him. And what do they do? They start a riot. And they force Paul and his companions out of Thessalonica. Then Paul goes and he finds himself... Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me now? No? Yes? Okay. Um, John, where are you? I can't turn that in. Oh, that might be better. And so when Paul is in Thessalonica, he's forced out and he has to go to Berea. And what's interesting is when he goes to Berea, he finds different kinds of Jews. They're actually studying the Word of God. And actually when Paul is teaching and preaching to them, they're searching the Scriptures to make sure what he is saying is genuine and real. So that is what ends up happening. Paul has some great news for them that Jesus Christ rose again according to the Scriptures. But here's what ends up happening in Thessalonica. Paul ends up having to flee once again to Athens. Why? Because the folks that are there in Thessalonica, they get a crowd together and they flee to Berea and they start an insurrection there. So you notice Paul is not witnessing, Paul is not sharing in the most comfortable of circumstances. Paul has to constantly be on the run. But what's interesting is that Paul comes to Athens and it's interesting what Scripture tells us in verse 16. It says this, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. What is interesting about Athens? Athens was considered the cultural center of that time. It was home to many influential philosophers. If you've heard of Socrates, if you've heard of Plato, if you've heard of Aristotle, that is where the thinking was coming from. Athens was where you would receive your education, where people would come to to find brand new information. So this is what was happening. Paul comes here, but what's interesting is that Paul, the Bible says, his spirit is provoked within him. His spirit is provoked within him. If you take a look at the word provoke, it literally means to stir up. He's not only filled with grief, he's also filled with indignation. Now you have to ask yourself this, why in the world is Paul filled with this kind of attitude? The Bible tells us it's because he was given over to idols. It was consumed with idols. Everywhere Paul looked in Athens, it was given over to idols. Can I tell you that the way that Paul is not going to react is not one of compromise, it's not one of running away, but Paul decides that he's going to engage the culture that he's in. That's much better. Right? So take a look at this. In the verse 16, it says, The Spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. It was a city where every single deity known to man was present. It was a pluralistic culture. And that's kind of where we are headed as America. We no longer can say that Christianity is the main religion of America. That's been long gone. We're a very pluralistic culture now. Wherever, whatever people decide to do is what they decide to do, and we are not allowed to judge them anymore. But here's what I find interesting about the idols that are there. Many times, for every single one of us, it's always easy to point out the idols that we can see, right? Now I want you to think about that. When you're going around and you're, when you're watching television, you can point and say, you know what, that's contrary to the Word of God. When you're looking over there, you can say, you know what, those people are not living the way that they should be. And what's interesting is that we're able to look at idols that are external, and we're able to say and point out and say, that is wrong. But can I tell you that the most dangerous idols in our life are the ones that cannot be seen. The ones that no one can see except for God. We have idols in our life, things that are consuming us, things that are taking over our life. Is our spirit one of grief and indignation? Do we say, God, I need you to come into my life and strip me of these idols and fill me with you? John Calvin has a tremendous quote. He says this, Man's mind is like a store of idolatry and superstitions, so much so that if a man believes his own mind, it is certain that he will forsake God and forge some idol in his own brain. It is so true of every single one of us. Let me share with you a couple of idols that we have. Some of you say, well, no, there's no way in the world that's an idol. But I'll share with you, especially in our current culture. Social media has become an idol in our life, believe it or not. 
Social media has become an idol in our life. Matter of fact, social media is the way that we end up communicating with one another, right? We no longer like to talk. Think about this. When was the last time a dear friend of yours, you actually picked up the phone and dialed and talked to them? <coughs> what do we do? We sit there and text them, right? I think sometimes people are surprised when you call them like, you're calling me? Like, that's weird. You know, I get to hear your voice, what you sound like. Whether you had a bad time or a good time, you know, whether, whatever you're doing, you know. We no longer like to do that because that has become an idol in our life. Matter of fact, we even like to take a Christian stand on Facebook. You notice people doing that, right? People post verses and people post things like, here's a picture of Jesus, and if you share it a thousand times, you'll be blessed. Really? Is, is that how shallow we have become as a culture of Christians? How in the world can we possibly touch a human soul without actually talking to them? How can we reach into their life and tell them about who God is and what He has done for them? Social media is a cop out. Jesus has told us, go out and preach the gospel. Talk to some people. Be in contact with people. Find out their hurts and their needs. We no longer use words to communicate. We have these idols of social media that are taking us away and distracting us from the Word of God and what He has called us to do. Look at verse 17. The Bible says, Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers, and the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Paul was reasoning with them. It was a custom of Paul's to be witnessing back and forth between the synagogue and marketplace to those who would listen. So basically, he's engaged in a casual conversation with them. You know what I think for us as Christians, we have in our mind, okay, I'm a Christian in a very secular culture. I need to have up my big sign here and tell people, if you do not repent, you will be eternally lost. And we think that that is called taking a stand. But what we fail to neglect is that the way that Jesus did it is he engaged people in conversation. How many of you like to talk here? All of you lying right now, right? Because I know every single one of you like to talk. We love to like and talk about sports. I mean, we can go on and on about the Reds, we can talk about the Bengals, we're not much to talk about now. Uh, we can talk about, you know, any other team. You know, we, we sit there and we have a great conversation. We know the stats, we know the records, we know everything. Whether it's entertainment, whether it's movies, we like to talk, but when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden we say, that's not my spiritual gift. I'm more of a background person. But see, God has called us to engage people in conversation many times. It doesn't have to be preaching in front of people. Sometimes it's getting with one soul, one-on-one, -on -one, and saying, Hey, what has God done for you, or how can I pray for you? That's how we can make a difference. Look at verse 18. It says, And certain Epicurean Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What is this babbler wanting to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Take a look at the word babbler there. It literally means seed picker. It is a picture of someone who picks up scraps of knowledge here and there and forms and articulates a particular worldview. It is someone who has no concrete basis for their beliefs. They were basically mocking Paul because they're saying, you're preaching to us about this Jesus and the resurrection. We don't understand it because it seems like you're coming up with some type of new idea. And he encounters two groups of people here. Number one, he encounters the Epicureans. And number two, he encounters the Stoics. Who were the Epicureans? Look at what they believed in. They pursued pleasure as the chief purpose in life and valued most of all the pleasure of a peaceful life free from pain, disturbing passions, and superstitious fears. They did not deny the existence of gods, but believed that they had nothing to do with man. One of the poems says this, this was their four-part cure. Don't fear God, don't worry about death. What is good is easy to get, and what is terrible is easy to endure. This is what their worldview was. Then there were the Stoics. They believed that everything was God and God was in everything. So they believed that all things, good or evil, were from God. And so nothing should be resisted. And they believed there was no particular direction or destiny for mankind. Now think about this. These two beliefs, the end result 
is pleasure in life, and the other one is it doesn't really matter what's going to happen. You are your own God. So these two groups form the trend which is taking place in our culture today at a very rapid rate. What you are seeing in our culture today is the same thing that happened in Judges when the Bible tells us when there was no king in the land, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. What's happening in front of us every single day? You know what has happened? We have removed God from His throne. You say, well, Dave, you can't really remove God from His throne. That's true. But you know, that's what our culture in general has done. People have removed God from the throne. Yes, this is something that we used to believe back in the day. So we say, you know what? We no longer believe the Bible. We no longer believe God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. No, we have rejected all those things because those are ancient manuscripts. We want something new. So what our culture has done is we have removed God from His throne and we have put ourselves on the throne. If you don't believe me when I say that, think about your own personal life. How often we like to cherry pick parts of Scripture, right? Oh, you know what? I'm really falling into this chapter right here. I'm really good at this. But what about this part right here? What, what about this part that says, you know, you deny everything and you follow the Lord Jesus Christ? We're, we're just like this word babbler. We cherry pick what we like because we're not really comfortable with the hard sayings of Scripture. And so Paul encounters the Epicureans and the Stoics. And here's what he finds out. And here's what we find out as well. Is that our pursuit of pleasure in America has only left us with more pain. You think about that? What have we been saying? You need to fulfill the American dream. Fulfill the American dream. Climb the corporate ladder. Get as much money as you can. Get the nicest house. Have nice cars. Have prestige and fame. And every single one of us has been part of that where we've pursued that. And what has it left us with? It has only left us with more pain. Because materialism will never satisfy our souls. Misplaced priorities in our lives. Verse 19, the Bible says this. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. Now think about this. Paul is in Athens, and the Bible says he goes to the Areopagus. Mars Hill is the Roman hill in Athens, and it's called the Hill of Ares. And there's some history behind it, but think about this. Mars Hill served as the meeting place for the Areopagus court, the highest court in Greece for civil, criminal, and religious matters. Even under Roman rule in the times of the New Testament, Mars Hill remained an important meeting place where philosophy, religion, and laws were discussed. So this is pretty epic here, okay? This is where court takes place. This is where you make your case. It is interesting that Paul comes to this court and he makes a case, he makes a defense for the God of the Bible. I mean, think about this. Paul is sitting on this hill. It sits about 377 feet high. And what more than likely happens is that as he's sitting, standing on top of this hill and he's proclaiming it to his audience, in his background, he probably had temple after temple after temple lined up. And Paul is going to make an absolutely great declaration. But what is the problem that takes place in Athens? Look at verse 21. For all the Athenians and foreigners who are there spend their time in nothing else but to either tell or to hear something new. What does it mean when the Bible says this new thing? Here's what it means. If what was becoming presently stale, they crave something still more new. Changing things all the time, constantly, not having any set of concrete beliefs. There's an Irish Methodist pastor who served in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and he saw a picture of London. Now, I want you to think about this. This is in the 1700s. And I want you to see what he observed, the trend that was taking place in London, and tell me if this does not show our culture today. Look at what he says when he observed London. He says, this is a striking feature of the city of London in the present day. The itch for news, which generally argues a worldly shallow or unsettled mind, is wonderfully prevalent. Even ministers of the gospel, negligent of their sacred functions, are becoming, in this sense, Athenians. So that the book of God is neither read nor studied with half the avidity and spirit as a newspaper. It is no wonder if such become political preachers and their sermons be no better than husks for swine. 
To such the hungry sheep look up and are not fed. Wow. What a, what a picture of America today, is it not? That no one wants to declare the Word of God anymore. We, we've just become political preachers. We've just become people that say, here's the new trend, just follow this. We're not going to judge you. You know who is going to judge you? God is. And God judges us by His Word. Jesus, when He had an encounter with the woman at the well in John chapter 4, said this, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. I'm so thankful that the God, Word of God is eternal. That it never changes. And you know why the Word of God never changes? Because it flows from the character of a God who never changes. And what's interesting is that in India today, there are over 300 million gods. Think about that. 300 million gods. What in the world are you supposed to believe? How are you supposed to live? Who are you supposed to sacrifice to? A culture, a worldview of confusion. I'm so glad that the Word of God is very clear in terms of who God is, what He has done, what He requires of me, and what the end is going to look like. Think about this when you look at Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well. Jesus wasn't offering this woman a religion. He wasn't offering her a philosophy. He was not offering her a methodology. He was not offering her ten steps to happiness, and the list goes on. You know what Jesus was doing when he was engaging in a conversation with this woman? He was offering himself. He says, I will give you living water. I am the one that can give you this water so that you will never thirst. Sidwell Baxter has an amazing quote. It's not up here, but I'll read it to you. Here's what he said. He said, fundamentally, our Lord's message was Himself. He did not come to preach a gospel. He Himself is that gospel. He did not come merely to give bread. He said, I am the bread. He did not merely come to shed light. He said, I am the light. He did not come merely to show the door. He said, I am the door. He did not come merely to name a shepherd. He said, I am the shepherd. He did not merely come to point the way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when we offer people something, we dare not offer people traditions and legalisms and rules and regulations. We better offer people Jesus Christ. Because otherwise we're offering them a false gospel. And God will hold us accountable for it. Verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the area of and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Paul says, I, I see that you are very religious. The word religious literally means in fear of God. They had all of these idols set up because they were living in fear. Am I, am I making this God happy? Is this God pleased with what I'm doing with my life? They had no satisfaction in their soul. The commentary talks about this phrase, the unknown God. Look at the historical perspective of this. It says this, Athens was filled with statues dedicated to the unknown God. 600 years before Paul, a terrible plague came on the city, and a man named Epimenides had an idea. He let loose a flock of sheep through the town, and whenever they lay down, they sacrificed that sheep to the God that had the nearest shrine or temple. If a sheep lay down near no shrine or temple, they sacrificed the sheep to the unknown God. So Paul comes into the city, he sees all kinds of idols, and then he sees, in case they left one out, they said, here, to the unknown God. Can you imagine living under that kind of bondage where you have no satisfaction? Of knowing what is right and what is wrong? Constantly having to do something to make God happy with you. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 to 23 says this, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. You know what Paul says in Romans 1? This is a pretty powerful passage. Paul says that God has given every single human being a revelation of himself. 
It is impossible for a human being to look at creation, to look at the order and intricacy of all things, and come to the conclusion that there is no God. But Paul says man has suppressed the truth, and he has made his own God in his mind, and that's why we see idols all around us. It gives us the context and background to humanity. Now look at what Paul says. This is amazing here. He says, Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. This is pretty epic right here. I love this. Notice that Paul's not like timid and scared, right? Paul's not like, man, I really hope they like me. I better change the message a little bit so they'll accept me. I just really need to be nice because I don't want them to hate me. No, Paul's bold. Look at what he says. He says, God who made the world and everything in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Paul preaching, and he sees the, everyone sees the temples behind him. Number two, Paul wanted to show that the one true God was creator, and not created as a figment of man's imagination. Number three, Paul also wanted to show that the one true God is not in need of anything, as opposed to the idols who constantly had sacrifices made to them. You know what's interesting is when you go to other countries and they have idol worship, it's always fascinated me. You'll see these idols and the people go and put a plate of food there. You know, one of these days I'm just going to like wait till it gets dark and go sneak the food, you know, and just get out of there. You know, no need to pay for it. People have like bottles of milk there. I'm like, are you serious? Like this is an idol. What in the world are you doing? If this is a God, why does he need food? Why does he need milk? What kind of God is this? You think about this, the God of the Bible is not in need of anything. Do you know that? Do you realize you cannot bribe God? You know, you can't go to God and say, well, God, if I do this and this and this for you, then surely you're going to do this for me. God's like, are you serious? I don't need you. I saved you. You, you better get on board with what I'm doing. Around the world, locally, Psalm 104 says this, He causes the grass to grow from the cattle and vegetation for the service of man that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. Do you realize that everything that we possess is a gift from God? You know, in our minds, we, we always think, like, this, this is our mentality. I work really hard for it, so I should be able to do whatever I want. Do you, I want you to think about something. The fact that you and I are even sitting here today is simply an act of God's grace. Do you realize that? Because there's a lot of people that did not wake up this morning. They actually died. If you look around the world, that's a fact. The fact that we get to walk, the fact that we get to see, the fact that we get to use our hands, the fact that we get to communicate is only because of God's grace that He has allowed us to live another day. So everything that we possess, everything that we earn, we need to be faithful stewards of it. We need to have Job's mentality where he says, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away Blessed be the name of the Lord. So instead of going to God with a clenched fist and saying, God, you can only have things in this hand, but in this thing, in this hand, I'm not going to release it to you. Why don't, why don't we just do this? He blesses us with it. We're good stewards of it. And then He gets to take it away from us whenever He pleases. It helps our perspective and our worldview. Look at verse 26. He says, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Here's what Paul is saying. The scattering of the people groups all over the earth, it's not by chance. It's by God's plan. You can look at scripture here. It's a reference to the creation of Adam and Eve and it's in the events surrounding the Tower of Babel. Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image and the image of God he created him. Male and female, He created them. Genesis 11, 9. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad the face of all the earth. Paul is laying out an apologetic, a defense of the faith. Here's what Paul is saying. If you look at the people groups all around the world, they all come from Adam and Eve. Right? So, actually, every single one of us are related. That's a scary thought. Somewhere down the line, we're kind of related. Okay, I end up getting the better tan, I realize that. Don't be bitter about it, okay? Uh, but what you think about it, isn't that a crazy thought? Because what does our culture do today? 
we, we separate everything based on so-called race. Do you realize there's no such thing as different races? Hello? There's only one race, the human race. And what's amazing is that when you look at our political system today, I'm just going to speak out about this, when you look at Ferguson, when you look at Baltimore, when you look at Charleston, every single person divides it by a black and white line, this race against this race. You know what the problem is? The problem is the human heart. Race, it has nothing to do with, it has everything to do with sin. And I want you to think about something. Do you realize when every single human being has ever been united in one purpose? I want you to think about this question. Think about the one time in history when all of humanity was in, uh, united in one purpose. You're like, there was a time such as this? Absolutely. You know when it happened? 2,000 years ago when our sins were put on Jesus Christ and He had to die for our sins. Oh yes, the world has been united, but it was united at the expense of the Son of God who died for our sins. And when we understand that unity in the aspect that all are sinners, all have fallen short of the glory of God, we understand what God has done in spreading the people groups of the world. I don't want to, I'm so tired of talking about racial reconciliation, aren't you? It gets old, it's dumb. If you don't want to talk about racial reconciliation apart from the Word of God, I don't want to listen to you. Because that has the answer to racial reconciliation. It is found in the person of Jesus Christ and in the Word of God. And that's what we need to be focusing on. Verse 27 says this, So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him. That He is not far from each one of us, for in Him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we also are His offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. You know what Paul says is the reason for God spreading out all the people all over the earth? It wasn't just because of judgment. Yes, they were building this tower and God had to confuse their language. But in that, God was also making a way so that He would get the glory by people from all walks of life, all around the earth, praising before the throne of God. Do you realize that heaven's going to be pretty diverse? Man, I sure hope heaven has some international food, right? Because I can only do pot roast for so long. Or, I'm sorry, all right? I just hope they have some spices there and just, you know, just have this huge meal. And it's going to be great. You know, gluttony in heaven. I don't know if that will happen, okay? But look at Revelation 7-9. Bible says this, John says, after this, after these things, I look, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, look at this, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Talk about a worship service. There are going to be millions upon millions upon millions of people from all around the world who have been saved by the blood of Jesus, standing before God's throne, proclaiming glory to the Lamb of God. I mean, what a day that's going to be. That God has done His work in spreading the people of all over the earth, that He brings them back to Himself to show His glorious plan in redemption. What's interesting is Paul says... He says, some of your own poets. You know what Paul did? Paul said, God's general revelation is so evident that even some of your own poets talk about it. There, there are two poets that he lists, and this is what they say. In him we live and move and have our being. For we also are his offspring. So if you look at those two poets that Paul mentions, these are the ones that were in the history of the Greek culture. So Paul is saying, look... I'm showing you that God's general revelation that He has shown Himself to humanity is evident in two of your poets. It's amazing the kind of tactic that Paul uses to reach them. Lastly, look at verse 30. He says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because He has appointed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man who He has ordained, he has given assurance of this all by rising him from the dead. Now take a look at times of ignorance there. In times of ignorance, God overlooked. Does that mean that God overlooks sin? That he doesn't punish sin? No, I don't think we need to get that picture from it. I simply think it means this. It doesn't mean that God ignores <clears throat> sin, but simply the fact that he has sometimes withheld his judgment in giving people time to repent. 
One of the characteristics of who God is, part of his character is that he's long-suffering. Is that he is patient. We lack patience, don't we? We truly do. Because what, what happens when some of you get work email? As soon as you see that little one come up on your mail app, what do you got to do? Oh man, I gotta check out what would someone say? And you're like, oh, it's a dumb group bomb for a burger place. Okay, come on, this is this is crazy. You know, all of a sudden you get a notification on Facebook. Oh, I better check it. You know, somebody really needs me right now. We get a text message, we hear that ding, you know, and, and we're doing something, we're like, somebody really wants to talk to me. That's our mentality in our mind. We just have no patience for things. But God, who is eternal, who has created us, He is long suffering. He is patient. And you know when God looks at America, the only reason that God hasn't judged America the way that He did Sodom and Gomorrah is only because of His grace. Do you realize that? The only reason God hasn't done something to America that like other nations in previous history, you know why? It's because of His grace. It has nothing to do with us. Let me ask you a question. How much longer does God wait in bringing judgment on America? I want you to think about that. You say, well, we're so much better than other people. Really? Supreme Court decides that, that the murder of children in the womb is okay, and God is just going, oh, but you're America, it's okay. Supreme Court decides that gay marriage is okay, and every other lifestyle is going to be okay, and it's going to be protected. God's sitting up there saying, oh, it's okay, no problem. You're America. You have such a rich heritage. You realize that judgment is just simply on the way. We just need to wake up and realize it. Why? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul says, God, he has, he's ignored these things in the past simply so that he can give people time to repent. Hebrews 9.27 He says that it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Do you realize every one of us is going to die one day? Some of you are like, man, that's so sad to think about. You know what it should do? It should cause us to wake up and realize, I need to live for God because I don't know when my last day on earth is going to be. It is appointed to man once to die and then to face the judgment. I close with this passage from Philippians chapter 2, which talks about judgment and what's going to happen. Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with, equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can you imagine the kind of day that's going to be? There are people in your life right now who you've been trying to share the gospel with that are pretty adamant that they're not going to listen to you. I don't want to have anything to do with this. I don't care about God. I don't care about Jesus. You know what? They don't have a choice. They're going to have to bow their knee one day. You will have to, when God comes one day, when Jesus is standing there, you have no other choice but to bow your knee to Him. Think about some of the worst tyrants in our world and in the history of the world. You think about Hitler, you think about Stalin, you think about Mao, you think about the emperors like Nero, you think about all these evil men who are so defiant and who people even thought were some form of God. They will have to stand before the righteous judge of heaven and they will have to bow their knee to Him. They will have to bow their knee and realize that they have fallen short of the glory of God and Jesus Christ will judge them. There's only two reasons that you would bow your knees to the Lord Jesus Christ one day. You will either bow your knee in fear and trepidation because you know you have sinned and time has run out. Or you will bow your knee before God and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. Thank you for the redemption that you offered to me. Folks, what Paul did, Paul didn't shy away. I think that's what many of us are looking at. We're saying, you know what, I'm just not going to engage people because they're going to get angry with me, they're going to be hateful towards me. We're not called to be people of retreat. Can I tell you, we as Christians have never in the history of Christianity ever relied on a political and national system to advance the gospel. You realize that? We don't need laws to advance the gospel. 
We, we don't need favorable circumstances to advance the gospel. All we need is the Holy Spirit of God working in us to reach one soul at a time. It doesn't matter what law is passed. What God is doing in America today is He is refining His church because the church will finally have to take a stand and say, this is what we believe and we are not going to run away from it. There's a lot of churches out there that are pushing and have been pushing the secret sensitive movement and say, you know what, you can just come as you are, don't worry about sin, don't worry about repentance, we're just going to love you, it's going to be okay. Those same churches will now either be forced to take a stand or compromise the Word of God. God is refining and purifying His church. You know why? Because we will have to come to a point in this culture where someone says, are you a Christian? You'll either have to say yes or no. And we may have to pay the consequences for that. Are you ready to stand up for that? Where you're at? Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to follow Him all the way? If your business is threatened, if your position as a teacher is threatened, if they're telling you that they need to teach all these different alternate lifestyles, are you willing to take a stand? God is refining and purifying His church. He has always done that in the midst of persecution. You know what happens when persecution comes? The church doesn't get weaker, the churches get stronger. God's people are strengthened. Because we truly know who we have believed. And we will go till the end, worshiping Him and praising Him and serving Him. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we enter into a time of communion. Take a moment where you're at. Take a moment to reflect on your heart. Where do you stand before God? Are you truly worshiping Him? Is He truly central in your life? Are you straying away from Him? What about the people that God has placed around you that don't know Him as their Savior? How do you engage them? I think God is calling you today to engage them in conversation and to share the love of Christ with them. Just for a few moments where you're at, then we're going to have communion, and Jesus is going to sing to us, but just reflect on your heart. Pour out your sins to God. Ask God to forgive you of your sins. Just in these few moments that we have together. And this time I'm just going to ask a few guys to come up. Tim, if you can help me. Don, if you can come up and help me. John. We're going to pass out communion. We would ask that as you take communion, that you only take it if you trust in Christ as your Savior. And take a moment to reflect as Lisa sings for us right now. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, <coughs> the emblem of suffering and shame. And I
Then you'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I will share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies out. First, first Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take and eat, remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross. Verse 25 says, In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us take it and drink. Let's bow for a word of prayer, and then I'm going to have Keith come up and share for us with a few minutes for uh, his progress in doing ministry in the Dominican Republic, and I'll have to close out in the word of prayer as well. So let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for these few moments that we've had to reflect on your word, on your goodness, and how you have called us not to be passive, Lord, but to engage our culture with the gospel and love of Jesus Christ. Now, Father, many times fear can grip us, as we talked about last week with Elijah, when he saw the threats, when he saw the things that were happening, Father, but I pray that we would stand with other believers, that we would be strengthened, that we would pray for each other, that we would study your word, that we would be people that you have called us to be according to your word, so that we can boldly declare your goodness uh, to a lost and dying culture. Father, we thank you even for this time of communion where we can reflect on the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins, so that we can have eternal life and the full forgiveness of sins. So Father, I pray that even as we leave this place, that we would be mindful of what you have commissioned us to do, that you have caused us to shine as lights to bear your light unto a world that is utterly in darkness. We love you and we thank you, Father, and we pray that you just be with Keith as he shares, and we thank you for him and his wife, Lord, and just giving them journey mercies and their son. We just pray that you just continue to bless them, Lord, even as they share right now. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Keith, you want to share back to the mic on the right? Thank you. Thank you guys very much um, for just giving us a couple of seconds. We have a really cool report. Um, I don't know if some of, maybe some of you have been following us online. My wife and I are one of your guys' missionaries, and we're totally grateful for that. We want you to know you were one of the first churches to pick us up. Um, the majority of our support comes from individuals, and we have had an amazing, uh, just over a year, um, we've been full-time missionaries trying to raise support, and we're about $3,000 uh, a month away from moving, which just so you know, okay, that's amazing because uh, the average missionary takes two to five years to raise ministry support. And we're looking at a target date of potentially uh, the beginning of, of 2016. And so that's pretty awesome. Here's something else. We had the privilege, a church sponsored us to go to the DR for a particular survey trip that was really a neat opportunity. And we got a meeting with the Attorney General's Office of the Dominican Republic. And if you don't know, we're, we're literally hoping that by God's grace that we land on the ground and we start a mission that rescues children out of sex slavery. And I love this <laughs> talk today because that's honestly what we're going to be giving them is the gospel. And so, not only did we get an appointment with the Attorney General's office, the Attorney General's office task force over all of the cases 
of sex trafficking in the country is about 42 police officials for 11 million people. Now, that's not much. Not when you look at what the states have or, or first world countries. And so we literally had an hour and a half with this, this uh, director and his assistant. And the first thing he asked, he's like, do you guys have any houses? And we're like, no, not yet. Um, we're hoping to be here as, as soon as we can. And he's like, well, um, will you be interested in taking the children that we actually reckon? We're like, absolutely. We would love to help with that. I said, how long have you guys been doing this? And he said, well, our task force has only been in existence for two years. And there's only 42 of us. And I said, wow. I said, how many uh, raids have you been a, a part of? And, and basically, last year, they rescued 48 girls and one boy. And almost in tears. And Dominicans don't cry. I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. They don't. Almost in tears, he says, we really need help. We rescued 48 girls and one boy, and we don't know where half of them are. And I was like, wow. And here is an official of the government in the capital city saying, would you help us? Like the God has like put us right in the vortex of a perfect window. And so when we were there, God allowed us to go on the strip, go undercover, see some people, and by a pure act of God, we were able to lead a hustler to Christ on the strip at about three in the morning. And it just like, just splashed into us so much that we were like, man, God, you're doing something. We've got to get here. As soon as we got back from that trip, we put our house up. Now, please listen to this. We put our house up on the market. And in three days, it was sold. So we are like homeless in a good way, and we're going around the country, um, still speaking in churches, speaking in schools, talking to individuals, and we're grateful, like over the top grateful for you guys and all of your prayers. So a couple of things. Please take one of our prayer cards. I don't know if we have any set out. Um, if you want our newsletter, here's something you can do. Text 22828. And put in Malugin, and you'll start getting our prayer letter. And so just follow the prompts, and those, we'll start giving you updates. And if you like our Facebook page, I know this is insane, and I think I told you guys last time. If you like our Facebook page, we get a donation. We got an insane donor who's like, if you get 10,000 likes, Keith, we'll give you $10,000. If you get 100,000 likes, we'll give you $100,000. And so, I know social media, social media, but this is like flying. So, go and like our page, like our videos. Every time you like our videos, here's how we interpret it. No matter what we say, no matter what it is, if you like it, we know you're praying for us. So, please keep us before the Lord. Thanks. All right, let's stand as we dismiss with a word of prayer. And you know, our, our church supports uh, the Malusians, but if you want to support them personally, I encourage you to do that. Uh, think about this. Think about all the waste that we have in our life that we spend on junk food and uh, five bucks coffee, Starbucks, right? But just think about it. What if you could save 10 bucks, 15 bucks, $20 even a month, and just give it towards that cause where you're rescuing children that are caught in this bondage? Uh, if you want to support them personally, go ahead. You know, it's, it's not our money, it's God's money. And so if you'd like to do that, go to them afterwards, pick up a card, and support them. Every little bit helps in picking away at what they need in doing this great mission. So we thank God for that thanksgiving. And so let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, again, we close with a time of rejoicing for the Malugians. Father, how you have blessed them and how you have encouraged them, even for things like selling their house, Father, in a matter of three days and an appointment with the Attorney General. Father, how you have arranged for these things that only your hand could have done. So pray that you just continue to give them more divine opportunities, that you would allow them to see your goodness and faithfulness to them. And I pray that you would get them uh, on the ground, Father, uh, on a timely basis and your perfect timing, and that uh, they would start doing the great work for them, Father. So thank you for showing yourself great on their behalf. And Father, I pray that as we leave this place, that uh, we would understand that you also seek to show yourself on our behalf, Father. And I pray that we would trust you through eyes of faith. For I ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.